This episode of Linux Action Show is brought to you by GoDaddy.com. And by Ting.com. Head over to last.ting.com and save $25 off your first device. Hello and welcome to the Linux Action Show, Season 27, Episode 10. My name is Chris. My name is Matt. Good morning to you, Matt. Good morning. Should I tell folks about the big show today? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a big show. So uh, coming up in the second half of the show, we'll go over how you can recover data from a failing hard drive. If you've had a drive that's gone on the kaputs, mm. like I have, mm. I lost three hard drives this last week, Matt. Three hard drives. Three so of them. Not two, not one, but three. I yeah, have become like, well-versed oh. in the uh, black oh, yeah. art of data recovery. So we'll cover that, and it turns out the best tools to do it are available for Linux. Nice. Good news. Good stuff. And then in slash Etsy, we'll go over setting up a honeypot for your network for fun and edutainment. Good stuff. And if you don't know what a honeypot is or why just some uh, average old Linux user out there might want one, well, we'll tell you. That's right. Stay tuned for slash Etsy. And we've got some great emails oh, yeah. the, at the end of the show, of course, and there's some of the news. Angry Linus is back, and then there's a little bit of a back and forth between him and some developers about his approach. Oh, yeah, always is. And then, but it ended up resulting in some shipped code, so that's good. That's good, you know, but Angry Linus is fun, Linus. And then there's some bad news for you Ubuntu users. We've got to uh -oh. cover that. Things are uh, not looking good this weekend over at the Ubuntu no, forums. We'll talk about not that. Not so much. But first, Matt, it's mm. our picks. woo -hoo! Yeah, and we've got uh, some fun picks this week. And I, I thought this might be the ultimate runs Linux pick. This, if stuff. I was ever going Real, to... Like the ultimate, like as in the absolute must-have, must-do. No, like maybe oh. like I can never top this one. Whoa. Yeah, like maybe the Runs oh. Linux is peaking at this very moment. Now oh, my goodness. I have a solution on how we can combat this challenge between okay. us and the community, but I'll play it right here. Now, this, uh, yeah. this Runs Linux this week is Modern Society Runs Linux. This is the Linux uh. Foundation Executive Director Jim Zimmelman, or Zimmin, Zimlin. Zimlin, I bet. Zimlin. Zim, 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 yeah. Zimlin. Anyways, he was in an interview with Bloomberg, and he says that, uh, yeah, basically, if you look at all of the machines from all the different range of devices to the Internet and everything, modern society runs Linux. I'll play a little bit of that. Wow. Big statement. It's, today of all days, Microsoft earnings out. Steve Ballmer, what was it, 15 years ago, I, saw, I think I remember he called Linux a cancer. That's right. Was he right? Well, clearly not. <laughs> so we've been called a lot worse than that. But, uh, you know, if you look over the last 15 years since then, just how wrong that has been proven. You know, every day, a couple million phones are activated running Linux. Every modern television, 700,000 a day are sold with Linux. Uh, every major stock market, New York, London, Tokyo, all Linux. You know, air traffic control, nuclear submarines, most of modern society. So maybe it metastasized in Redmond. I mean, I mean you know, it, it is the, the, the basic notion of Linux, even, even though it continues to develop and change, is sort of fundamentally opposed against the idea of you know, because all those industries you just mentioned, maybe the exception of stock trading, Microsoft's had to take a, wanted to take a piece of, whether it's mobile devices or... And or, they show this random uh, clips right. of, the, uh, of the terminal. Like, I, I just like, this is so weird, the commands they show. Like, this guy uh, sorts a CSV file. <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> Anyways. Like, why show a desktop when you can show but a the, command But the point was poignant that he makes there. I mean, he just kind of slips it in there during the interview, but he says that really, if you look at it, most of modern society, it now... Uh, do all individuals run that? No, not in all cases, sure. but there's really no services that are online that people use today that they're not That's at right. least in some way using Linux. You're touched in some way or fashion. Yeah. Absolutely. So now, now that, now the, you know, that's modern society. That's big. That's big. Mm -hmm. So we've got to bring it home. So I want to feature some local runs Linux picks. So you guys nice. out there, send in your runs Linux to Linux Action Show at jupiterbroadcasting.com or start a thread in our subreddit, linuxactionshow.reddit.com. Good deal. A pink, uh, we want pics of Linux in action in the real world. And uh, I got some emails. I always Good get stuff. some emails on this stuff, but I always need pictures because then I have something to show. So pictures are really a key factor. Okay. Yeah. So I want to do more like, uh, I want to bring it back to the community runs Linux stuff. Good stuff. Okay, now my app pick this week, I did a little victory lap when I saw this ship, so I'm really excited to talk about it. But first, I want to thank this week's sponsor, Matt. Woo! GoDaddy.com. GoDaddy! Woo! That's right. Now, uh, see, we have a secret hookup over at GoDaddy.com, and we get some great deals. And sometimes that secret hookup, I can't name her. Oh, yeah. I, she texted me last night and said, don't mention my name. People Keep get it jealous, the down low. but uh, see, sometimes our special relationship even benefits some of our listeners here, like Robert. Uh, Robert emailed and he says, "Hey guys, I'm a longtime listener of Last, and just wanted to thank you for your GoDaddy promo code. I'm getting married soon, and was in the process of sending out wedding invitations with my fiance yesterday, which she commented that we should put an email address on the invitations that people could respond to. I have a great idea," he said. 
let's have a custom domain specifically for the wedding that people could email. Oh, that's cool. She, she responds skeptically, wouldn't that be expensive? Yeah. Not at all, he says. <laughs> It'll cost $2.49 for the domain. Like that. She thought it was a great idea, so I grabbed your Linux 249 promo code, and within five minutes, had a brand new domain name registered for our wedding for less money than I spend on some apps. That's awesome. Thanks for allowing me to geek out and bring a little class to my wedding invitations for very little money and keep up the great work on the show. That is so cool. What a great idea. Well, right? congratulations to you, Robert, and uh, way okay. to play it, sir. Way to play it. Looking like a hero for mm -hmm. the day. So when you're over at GoDaddy.com, if you want to get yourself a .com, use our code Linux249 to get that .com for $2.49. You can also pick up some additional domains after that for $9.99. So it's still a really great deal for extra domains. Maybe you want to get some hosting. Maybe you want to host a little blog for that oh, wedding, yeah. or like me, I got my third kid on the Share way. Share photos. Moment. I mean, there's, the options are limitless. You, within a few clicks, you can throw up a WordPress site or a mm -hmm. gallery site That's on right. GoDaddy, and you can use our code GO32 off 2 to save 32% off your entire order. So you get the domain in there, yeah. you get the hosting in there, boom, you use GO32 off 2 Wham, to get 32% nice off. So there you go, Linux249, I get a .com for $2.49, or GO32 off 2 to get anything in your cart off. For 32 cents. You gotta or love 32%. That. 30 percent. Yeah. Something like something like that. Something, something like that. that. Every time I see Danica, I just get a little distracted. I know. It's kinda like, whoa, hey, hi. I'm just what? saying, Matt. I'm just saying. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, GoDaddy, for sponsoring the Linux Action Show. All right, Matt, I am excited about mm. this about this app pick this week. For the oh, Android yeah. device, first up, BitTorrent Sync. Oh my goodness. For Android. Oh, yeah. No, this this sets a level of good luck yeah. surpassing it. Oh boy. So here's what's great. Mm. Is uh, you, you still retain that same good direct peer to peer. Sure doesn't go through their cloud server at all. Mm -hmm. And it's super easy to set up with your device. When you, so you, in BitTorrent Sync, right. you bring up the folder you want to share with your Android device, okay. and it will display a QR code. Oh, you so just scan that with bam. the app, and it's, it, it, links the, it links the BitTorrent Sync <laughs> app to that folder. How that's cool. And I love get, that. And it gets even better. Now, remember, see, mm. for me, the key thing about BitTorrent Sync is, is it's from my machine to my device. From my machine, if it's over the LAN, it never even leaves my network. Mm -hmm. And you can verify this by watching it on the firewall. You'll see that BitTorrent Sync will never go outside your LAN oh, to that's copy so machine. Awesome. I think that's a big deal. Yeah. I, for me, that's that's it's a, a really great security, right? Exactly. Here's what's also awesome about the new BitTorrent Sync app: is out of the gate they added Photo Sync. So when you take a photo with your Android. Uh, you yeah, know, camera phone. Sure. You, you can have it, just like we can with Dropbox now, you can have it automatically upload to a BitTorrent Sync folder. So you snap a picture, it's on your desktop. You snap a picture, oh, it's on wow. your desktop. Boom, boom, boom. So if you're taking pictures, you may not necessarily want to have up in the cloud. Well, or, you know, you know for me, for example, like, it's great because on, on Dropbox, they'll give you, like, five gigs. Mm -hmm. But... The, yeah, you get the unlimited storage this way because it's really you're in charge. Yeah, with BitTorrent Sync, it's yeah. unlimited. But see, with Dropbox, the problem is that five gigs, it goes real fast. It because on, on my phone, I have very high resolution pictures and I'm snapping like a whole bunch to use the Google Plus animated stuff yep. so I'm taking tons and tons of pictures and I'm <laughs> and filling out my Dropbox. Up, right? yep. I got way too much stuff in my Dropbox See, and I, then I sit there and stress about filling out my Dropbox and having to pay more what for Dropbox. What do I gotta delete? You know, with BitTorrent Sync it's all automatic. Now every time we talk about BitTorrent Sync one of the things that we get responses on and I think it's a valid point is that it's not open source. Well that's true. And, that's and true. To, to make matters worse to make matters worse some people associated with the project some people associated with the project have said that the reason they haven't gone open source is because they don't want to make it insecure. They're worried that going open source would make it insecure. Obviously, that's crap. Yeah, that's, that, that's doesn't really, that doesn't add up. No, that's, yeah. that's bad math, and yeah. that kind of makes me a little worried. But there has been some talk about them open sourcing it. Right now, the problem is, is that I don't know of anything else that uses this sophisticated level of encryption with this ease of use with a mobile app that's also machine-to-machine. -machine. I'm not aware of anything, That's actually. what the machine-to-machine -machine is, yeah. the, is the biggest part for me. I don't want any cloud service. No, if no, I no. want cloud hosting, I will put it on my own system. I'll attach some disk to that. Absolutely. All right, Matt. So right. Uh, that is the Android Epic. That's BitTorrent Sync, and of course, it's free. Uh, BitTorrent Sync, by the way, uh, just hit uh, beta. So they just left alpha. That's cool. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good stuff. Next pick. Been a little uh, while since we've done a console pick. It has. I think we were due. And last week, we had an email where this guy was questioning how to uh, sort of dial down specific bandwidth right. usage of certain applications. Which matters, especially if you're uh, limited. I, I can't believe afterwards, after we got off, after we went off there, I said, oh, we should have mentioned Iftop. Right. So then he could at least kind of see where things at. So Iftop is uh, it's available, I'm sure, in any local repo for your distro. Oh, absolutely. And it is a console program, but it's super easy to use. I love finding these console apps that are easy enough for folks to use. Yeah, you just type it in, go. Yeah, so if sort of Iftop, sort of like the regular top, it's think of top for uh, your network connections. And it'll actually show you the bandwidth usage of individual applications. So I don't oh, have a ton of apps cool. running on my machine right now. But as different apps talk to different stuff, 
So I thought, so for example, um, we could probably, let's go over here to do like a speed test .net, right? Yeah, totally. And just as I start to do stuff, you can start to see um, the different, uh, the different like bandwidth. Oh, right, uh, right. These, So these are, these are, this is a line graph basically here. Oh, that's cool. And you can see the individual, it breaks it out by individual uh, um, um, packets and data. So you can see right it in real there. time. Oh, that's yeah. neat. And then you get yeah. totals down here at the bottom. So you can see that, it, you can see specific applications, mm -hmm. how much exactly, how much bandwidth they're using. So I can, uh, so if I go into like, uh, go do the speed test. And uh, now once it, once it fires up, you'll see that uh, that oh, one goes, goes up to the top. Yeah, see NetRiver, because I'm talking to the server in Linwood. And now you can see that I'm getting about 46 megabytes a second, 47 megabytes a second to uh, 40 megabits to uh, NetRiver. Oh, that's cool. And you can kind of compare it to the readout that it's giving yeah. you. Yeah. So, now, there's, so now, we're, now we're doing the upload there, and we go over here, and now you can see that uh, you can see in the sending column that my data is going oh, crazy. Oh, yeah. And this is, these are totals. These are aggregates right here on sure. this. So this is – and, and then up here you have bit. the graph along the top. This is a really nice way to, oh. so if you had uh, Steam going and you had your web browser going and maybe you had a live stream yeah. up, you could actually break out, each, you could see your live stream is taking this, uh, you know, 100 kilobytes a second. You could see that Steam's pulling down 4 megabits a second. Yeah. You could see your web browser's using on average 100 kilobytes a second. And it's a really easy way, uh, either through an SSH session, so you can remote into a system or just right here on your box Absolutely. or like... Under like the uh, uh, under a drop down terminal, right. this is a great app to keep running in a drop down. It's a great way to know what's chewing through chewing through your bandwidth. It's like hey, yeah, you know, what's it's, going on? It's also interesting to just see the various machines. Like I'm talking to my wife's iMac upstairs right oh, now for yeah. some reason. Right. Um, I'm talking to uh, one of my one of my home servers. So I can kind of I also get at a glance. There's a machine out on the public internet that I'm talking to. Weird. Uh, yeah. So isn't that kind of neat? Just that's look really at that and see nice. What's up. There you go. So that's Iftop, and uh, it's available in your local distro repo. And it's uh, super simple to use. I mean, I love simple. the fact it's laid out in a way that you can just kind of absorb as you go. Mm -hmm. It's cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Me like you. Yeah. And you can see, like, when you actually, like, get some sustained transfers, you can see here you've got these, these are, these established like a bar graph. And you can see that oh, here's, right. like, the top vertical here shows you the totals and this bar graph's going up there. Yeah. It's, well, that, I love that progression. that You can actually see it taking place in real time. That's neat. That would be if top for you, Matt. Good stuff. If top. Yeah. I, uh, top. I was playing around uh, moving data around because, so, uh, this week... I lost uh, three hard drives in my 12 terabyte array, and it's, it's one of those things where like the first drive went, and I was like, "Well, I'll get to that." But I got fancy ZFS; I'm not too worried. <laughs> and I know better. I, you know, I know better. I, I know better. I know better. But I'm busy. I'm busy, and it's one of those things that's easy to forget about because it's out of sight because it's yeah. actually literally behind our screen here. Um, and then I lost the two other drives. Oh, ouch! Yeah. So, ouch. Uh, so that was this week. So I was moving a lot of data around, recovering stuff, and so I was using Iftop to sort of monitor those transfers. Uh -huh. In progress. Oh man, I have a bonus app pick I want to make this week. I think I mentioned it. I either mentioned it in the show. Or I definitely mentioned it on the live stream last week. Oh yes. Uh, by the way, Linux Action shows live Sundays at 10 a.m., which is uh, um, I don't know. what is that? A uh, uh, 1 p.m. Actually, Eastern. Something? No, uh, I oh. think I have it all. I lined it all out oh, here. Did right you actually get all the little time? Look at me. I always get a time. It's, math you said one p.m. You're correct. The yeah. math I have a hard time is UTC. It's 6 p.m. UTC. Oh, UTC yeah. blows my mind. I can't over, even. Over at jblive.tv, and uh, I definitely sometimes during the segments we'll play some yep. extra games. We'll play clips and stuff like that. Uh, I, I don't know if I mentioned this in the show, but Gateways, uh, fan of the show, David is the author of Gateways. It just oh, hit cool. Steam recently. It's a fun side-scrolling uh, 2D platform game. Set in, a, set in the lab of uh, Ed. He's a scientist, and he's following the outbreak of a number of his creative experiments. And you jump on them, it's, it, and you, uh, he, he has a... Uh, not only does it sort of have all the traditional, like, jump on the bad guy's yeah, head right. kind of thing, get, get, the, get the stuff, but uh, you also have uh, moving platforms, and you have gateway guns that allow you to place two gateways on the That's walls, awesome. floors, and ceilings of the lab, and you can pass through those and emerge out of the other. It was, I, like I don't that. know if it's still on sale, but it was on sale this last week on Steam. It'd be worth checking out either way. Mm -hmm. I think it's really awesome that uh, you know a fan of the show did this. Totally, yeah, so. right. I mean, what a, what a great thing to do. By the way, uh, the Linux Action Show is also live at 1900 uh, so awesome. Central Time or CEST. Um, what else we got here? Uh, it's uh, by the way, it's 1400 in Brazil right 1400 now. 1400 in Brazil. Yeah. How about right. that? There yeah. you go. So thanks you guys for joining us live on the uh, Linux Action Show, and mm -hmm. it's the last day of Steam sales. Oh, oh. 19, 1934 in Croatia. Yeah. Okay. Wow. There you go. Huh. It's 11 where that guy's at. <laughs> wow, that's commitment. Good stuff. Yeah, Glad nice to be to spending the evening with, with you. Today. All right, Matt. Well, so go check out Gateways, everybody. We got links to all of our picks in the show notes, including all our past picks. And congratulations to David. It's a very fun game. Uh, my son and I were playing Gateways uh, over the past week, and he got a kick out of it. Oh, I bet you guys had a ball. Yeah, so that's cool. All right, Matt. Let's do the news. <laughs>
Hey, it's the news, and this episode is brought to you by Ting.com. Matt, of course, Ting is mobile that makes sense, and I am a happy Ting customer. And you know, I'd like to direct everyone right now, stop what you're doing. Stop. 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 Go to last.ting.com and enjoy the beautiful savings. That's right. If you go to last.ting.com, you get $25 off most Ting devices, or $25 towards your first Ting service if you bring your own device. Now, why Ting? Why Ting? Friends, I will tell you why. No contracts and no early termination fees. That's right there, worth the price of admission. But on top of that, there's no bundling or ride-along services, no overcharges or penalties, and you're going to love the way Ting does their billing. So you pay for what you use. They're totally, totally flexible plans. You break your rates out into minutes, you got your text message and your megabytes, and then they're going to bill you at the end of the month for whatever bucket that you just fall into, and you can go over to their rate page and you can kind of get a little idea. Now, I will show you mine. To give you an example, right now I have two devices on my on my account. Okay. And I, it's kind of fluctuates depending on what I have, because oh, it's just a flat rate of $6. So if oh, I wow. want it, yeah, wow. $6 per device, wow. and you just pay for what you use. Oh, that's awesome. So this is great. So I have my HTC One and my Galaxy Note 2 on there right now. Sure. Uh, I broke my mom off under her own plan, which is awesome because now she's going to add her husband. They're going to do their own oh, thing. Oh, that's $6. cool. $6. Right. It's great, right? And so if I go over to my dashboard with two phones, two phones two on phones my account. Two $21 right now is what my bill's at. Boom! Mine $21. And then uh, here, this is what I also love about Ting, is you can see how they'll break it out. Now, I'm, mo I'm mostly a data guy. I do even right. my text messages are over Google Voice. All of that is technically data. Sure. Now, a few things automatically spill over into text messaging. And you know how that always kind of bites you if you want no text messages? Exactly, because you right. don't think about it, right? Look, for Ting right now, it says current text, 22 I'm going to pay $3. Oh, man, seriously. $3 for my text message. And you don't even month. care because it's $3. No, right? it's fine. I mean, that's like, fine. Whatever. Sure. On average, you know, you can, it breaks it all out. You know, it gives you some estimations. You can see on my data right now, I'm falling into the small bucket. Right. I've, I've used uh, 64 megabytes. Uh, on average, I've, I'll use 400 to 500 megabytes, but this week I've been, or this uh, month, I've been on Wi Fi an awful lot. Well, I think what's cool is like if you have a really extensive one month, and then like the next month, it's kind of small. It all adapts. It yeah. all kind of rolls into it. Yeah, it's nice. I just pay for what I use, and mm -hmm. I really, really appreciate that. Like Not that. only that, but all of the devices on Ting.com are unlocked. So when you combine the fact that you're only paying for what you use, and they have an awesome selection of devices that come unlocked, this is really where you're starting to you're starting to be empowered as the customer. Instead of being in the position where the carrier's got you in these contracts, the carrier's selling your information, right. the carrier's trying to convince you to use these crappy upgrade uh -huh. cycles that are actually totally ripping you off. Yep. None of that's in play here. The, the relationship between you and Ting is very clear. It's 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 how it should be. The transparency is genuinely there. Go to last.ting.com. And if you want to try out a different route, check out their customer service. Call them 1 855 Ting FTW between 8 p.m. Either. And I hear they got live PM. people there. Eastern the phone. time. Live people, Matt. Live people. Either. 8 p.m. You stuff. got this whole range, guys. We're going to let you. You can call them between 8 a.m. or 8, 8 p.m. I'm going to let you pick just time between there. You want to call them at 1 p.m.? That's fine. Just don't call them at 9 p.m. or 7 a.m. Mm -hmm. Anytime between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. 8 and 8. Somebody's going to answer that phone. That's right. How nice is that? Gotta love it. Thanks to Ting for sponsoring Linux Action Show. Go to last.ting.com and see what I'm talking about. You yes. Good All stuff. Right, so let's talk about Linus. Oh, yeah. Uh, we actually had mentioned recently that he hadn't been making a big fuss. It was kind of funny. Yeah. And then uh, he sends out an email. It starts with, what the F, guys? <laughs> <laughs> but at least you know, what you, you know right off the bat the tone of the email, so you can choose to continue reading at this point. Uh, this piece of S commit is marked for stable, but you clearly never even test compiled it, did you? <laughs> wow. You know, let's, let's get serious here. He's talking about code for the Linux kernel. It should and be for a, stable at that. It should know. be of a certain quality. Then he right. continues to call out where the issues are and says, seriously, WTF, I made the mistake of doing multiple merges back to back with the intention of not doing a full all mod config build in mm -hmm. between them. He's mad, Matt. He's mad. Mm -mm. He's and, not having it. And why the hell was this marked for stable? He goes on to say, <laughs> there aren't enough swear words in the English language, so I now have to call you a pariki and vatulplu just to express <laughs> my disgust and frustration with this crap. Vatulplu, I don't know what that is. Wow. Boy, um, you know. So that's Linus. But Motivating you know, the troops. As absolutely. And, and if you look at the underlying issue, it's valid, right? I yeah. Mean, I mean, you are talking about maybe one of the most important open source projects in yeah. mankind, and you want to make sure that the core of that is... Uh, Stables it's not like it's a font and the Fs are backwards or right. something, right? I mean, it's, like, it's a big deal. Uh, so uh, we all saw this hit the web, and we all kind of, oh, Linus, it's so great to have you back, right? <laughs> but one of the developers on the uh, Linux kernel mailing list was not so impressed, Sarah Sharp. Mm. Uh, no, she, she, wasn't. she writes in and says, uh, seriously, guys, 
is this what we need to do in order to improve stable? And she goes on to make the case that uh, this kind of this yeah. kind of approach, this sort of uh, I guess heavy-handed <sighs> hammer approach that Linus takes, is not professional. She says we need to keep it professional on the mailing list. She says we need to discuss it at the Linux kernel summit where we can at least yell at each other in person. And I think part of her point too is that this yeah. is all being done in public. Well, two things, I, and I agree with her on the latter part. Seeing this in person would be awesome, and it'd be epic, and it'd be worth filming. As far as the other stuff, wah, you know, get over it. I mean, honestly, I don't, I just, I, I, I understand her point, but Linus has been ultimately clear, and he has no intention of being professional. He has intention of being Linus. And you can either suck it up and accept that or yeah. move on. I mean, I know that it's so, hard to accept. That but. is Linus's core argument, is that Linus thinks that a lot of that professionalism and uh, platitudes is... Is is fronting? It's false. It's yeah. it's not being genuine, and uh, that's true. And I, I'm not and I'm not saying that I can I would personally do this. No, it's not my style. But I'm not going to rip on somebody who chooses to in their realm and their world and their. This is his deal. Uh, Torvalds uh, responded to uh, her comment with uh, mostly because it's who I am, and partially because I honestly despise being subtle for nice or nice. <laughs> the fact is, people need to know what my positions on things are. And I can't just say, please don't do that, because people won't listen. I say, oh, <laughs> Internet, nobody can hear you being subtle, and I mean it. And I definitely am not willing to, st to uh, string people along either. I've had that happen too, not telling people clearly enough that, they don't, that I don't like their approach. They go on to re-architect something, and they get really upset when I'm not willing to take their work. Sarah, first off, I don't know that I have many tools at hand. Secondly, I simply don't believe in being polite or po politically correct. And you can point to all those cultural factors where some cultures are not happy with confrontation and... I feel free to make it about gender, too, and I think it's almost entirely cultural, too. And please don't bring up cultural sensitivity while at it. And I'll give, some, I'll give you back some of that cultural sensitivity. Please be <laughs> sensitive to my culture, too. Yeah. The uh, do you really want to oppress a minority? <laughs> he goes on to say, because Finns are a minority <laughs> compared to almost all <laughs> any other country. Do you want to talk about cultural sensitivity? Because I'll join you. Uh, but my culture includes cursing. Um, he concludes with, because if you want me to act professional, I can tell you that I'm not interested. I'm sitting in my home office wearing a bathrobe. The same That's way I'm not point, going to yeah. start wearing ties, I'm also not going to start buying into fake politicalness. The line, the office politics, the backstabbing, and the passive-aggressive, and the buzzwords. Because that is what acting professionally results in. People resort to all kinds of really nasty things because they are forced to act out their natural, normal urges in unnatural right. ways. Passive aggressiveness and all this other nonsense, you know, lots of office politics. Yeah, no, I, I'm on board with it. Like I said, not my personal approach to how I would deal with it, but at the same time, I've talked to other women about this issue to find out if it was, in fact, a gender thing. And my wife included in that batch of people said, who the hell cares? Why is this an issue? Why is she yeah. whining about it? She, my wife said, why? The, you know, so it's not, I, honestly, I think this person, this individual, is being overly sensitive and needs to grow up. He did kind of tone it down a little so. bit in a following update. He said, well, I look forward to still working out workflow issues at the Colonel Summit. I wouldn't even like done that. that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I've seen, I, I, I tend to agree with you uh, almost entirely. However, I temper it a little bit because I've seen so many people in the comment discussion threads around that, that really do seem to take issue with it. Like, uh, even in our own subreddit, where you'd think it'd be kind of all pro-Linus, there's enough people in there that kind of say, well, wait a minute, do we really have to discourse like this? Uh, an example would be like if you went into a subreddit and had a rant. And there were lots of, you know, four little... Four never. Little, ne never happened, right? But the key issue is, it's your subreddit, right? Now, if another person goes and does that, it might be interpreted differently. But in this particular instance, it's, it's your baby. It's your thing. I see, I see this with Linus yeah. as being the same thing in that... Per, again, I'm not... That's how I see it. I'm not it's, necessarily saying, I'm going to do that, but, you know, I, it's his... It's we his might kernel. all use it, but it's his kernel. Yeah, I mean, really it is. It is a dictatorship. This is not... And she's mistaking this for a democracy. It's not. Wait, I, I'm sorry, but it really isn't. He does run the show yeah. for the colonel. And, you know, uh, we've also made this argument before. Uh, so. History has shown us that any, any, any leader in this, sort of this role where if you've ever worked with developers, you kind of know what it's like <laughs> to work with developers and to get them nope. to do things. And, and it's just, it can be a challenge. No offense, developers. Uh, but you know it's true. And so you've seen things like you see stories of how Gates would sometimes yep. rail on people or definitely you'd see story about jobs and... You wonder, you wonder, like if maybe when you get to the point where you're sort of the pack of, of a, when you're the when you're the alpha dog of a pack of alpha dogs. Well, it's like being in prison, right? I mean, it's like you know, he, he, <laughs> Linus has got people hanging on to his front pockets, walking down the walking down the alley, right? I mean, he's got his thing going on, and somebody's all throwing up some signs or whatever. He's got to put them in their place, and that's kind of what he does. Is he deals with stupid all day long, 
and after a while, I think that kind of builds up, and he's got to he's got to alpha dog it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And then sometimes also yeah. uh, people who uh, different people at different levels of the projects can sort of experience different levels of disconnect. Where Linus can be very much, you know, he's on the raw nerve of it. He's yeah. very cognizant of what's going on. Yeah. He's he sees a lot of angles, and some people get the advantage of sitting back and then sort of picking. Well, that doesn't seem that doesn't seem right. Well, of course, you have the advantage of perspective. You're not actually on the ground doing the work. I get cussed out by Linus. I'm printing that out, putting it in a frame and totally. on my wall. I'm that's proud achievement of that, unlocked. Right? Yeah. Uh, but Come at the on. end of the day, uh, what, we, what we got we got some things that actually matter. Between all of the uh, kerfuffle, uh, Linux 3.11 has been officially named Linux for workgroups. And there were no f words involved in the naming scheme. Yep, he decided Same. to change the code name. Not only did he change the code name, but we got a really crappy uh, logo too to go with it. Uh, where uh, <laughs> I thought, you know, uh, so let's see, uh, Windows, Windows for Workgroups 3.11 uh, 3 came out mm -hmm. in 1993. Right. And there it is right there. You see the little touch? Uh, oh, that's, little touch? that's awesome, really. Yeah. Mm, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, no, we, not, not feeling the logo, man. Not I, think, logo. I think we made this joke. Uh, I think so. I was thinking a little Microsoft in there. Yeah. Just as a note, I'm on the H open. The H uh, mm -hmm. online site right now. Uh, oh, yeah. They're shutting down. The H is closing down. They announced uh, um, on the 19th that they will be uh, closing down the site, which is too bad. It's been a good online resource. Yeah, it has. It's, you know, they're like a lot of places I've worked in the past. It's really hard to monetize content. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, I feel bad for them. Um, it yeah, sounds absolutely. like some of them may be able to work for the parent company, perhaps. It sounds like there's maybe some job opportunities in there, hopefully. So. Yeah, you know, uh, Michael so. uh, over on Pharonix uh, wrote up a piece about them shutting down, and uh, you know, he kind of points out that sort of the reason why Pharonix is able to continue on is because uh, it's a one-man show over there. He does all of the work. That, and also, and people hate this, but it works. Um, titles matter, you know, and sometimes getting people into the article is half yeah. the battle. So, yeah. you know, the trying to yeah, balance well, that out. And when you look you at know. the mainstream uh, publishing business, there are people. The only job they have is to come up with titles. Yeah. Like they don't even write the article, and the guy that writes the article doesn't even pick the title. I don't get to pick the titles. Yeah. You don't. Mm -mm. So when you write for your Datamation, That's you right. don't pick the titles. That's right. Okay. Every everything we do is designed to, you know, obviously offer some value, but we need to get people in there. We need to make sure people are discovering that, and that really is a factor. And they so. know because they're looking at the analytics. Oh and yeah. Things like I mean, that. it's like you know, if yeah. you want to continue working here, this is how this works. You know, it's it's what it is. What I what what bums me so. about it is there's a few sites that sort of do like um, I I, I don't want to name names, but they're not. <laughs> Not ones we talk about a lot on the show, but right. there's some sites that, oh, it's almost like they do lip service open source coverage. It's not right. actual open source coverage. Like sometimes right. some of ZDNet's coverage can be a little bit like that. When it's usually, you can tell, um, usually it's someone that is running Windows or OS 10 and they're writing about Linux. You can almost always spot it because it's very superficial. They don't even know the names of the tools. They may not even know how those tools interact with other things. Yeah. It's usually very right. along the top. And of I it. never got that impression from yeah. the age. And so, no, they, they know their stuff backwards yeah. and forwards. I mean, it was that's fantastic. What I, that's what I really hate to see yeah. is. Um, you know, uh, a, a site that was actually, um, really actually in the community, shutting down. Well, and if I'm them, and if you guys are watching, my advice, honestly, hit the Linux mags. They would love to have you guys on. Yeah. I PC, know that for a you fact. Know, PC, yeah, chat room's calling out uh, Network World, PC yeah. World, all those kind of fit in that category of it's like yeah, kind of hollow really open source coverage. Pretty, pretty soft stuff, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, guys, hit the, hit the Linux mags. Uh, there's always work out there for you. You know, just got to just gotta hit them up. And speaking of work, uh, back to Linus, he calls for more Linux patches. Linus yep. usually complaining about too many pull requests during a kernel uh, development cycle, but this time he's complaining about hmm. too few patches. Really? Yeah. He's Make up your he's mind, also, Linus. Come on. He proclaimed himself <laughs> the Goldilocks of kernel development. He says, we're halfway through the first week and merge the Windows really? closed, and normally I'd be complaining. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, nobody. Uh, he, says, uh, he says, so send in your code. Oh. Send in your code. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I, I, I feel like, you know, maybe it's time to... Call Linus out on that. And be like, dude, seriously, make up your mind. Either you want patches or you don't. You know, just saying. Just he saying. wants. He doesn't want too much, but he doesn't want too little, man. Just saying, man. Don't you understand? Don't you throw understand? Throw some patches and little left bombs in there. I don't know. All right, I want to talk. Right. Uh, so, um, Ubuntu, Ubuntu's got a lot going on right oh, now. Oh, big stuff. Uh, yeah. Some some bad news, some good news, mm. some rumors. A lot of and, activity. Uh, during all of it, uh, Mr. Shuttleworth, Mr. Mark Shuttleworth, the was Shuttle interviewed uh, by uh, Mobile World Live, mm. and uh, while he was there. They asked him a few questions about uh, what is when you're go like I, I highlighted two parts. Now the interview mm -hmm. itself is about ten minutes, and I pulled like a minute worth of clips. I'm going to play sure. them for you guys. They asked like uh, the first question out of the gate was uh, what is when you're going to sit down with carriers. What right. are sort of your core competitive advantages of the Ubuntu phone platform oh. 
over, say, uh, some of the others. And so, uh, Mark... Oh, the, qu the, the questions that Microsoft didn't ask when they were right. developing their stuff. I understand. So here's okay. Mark's answer. So a core part of our positioning is as a platform that integrates services from the, the operators and carriers. Um, and that means that it, it, it's, it's very clear how operators who engage with Ubuntu um, would deliver their own portfolio of content, services, um, and, and, uh, and capabilities. Um, those allow them to differentiate without fragmenting the platform. They also allow them to, to, to build a deeper relationship with the end user than they do if they're simply a, a pipe uh, for, for voice or data. Okay, so I want to translate that a little bit. So remember, this is the sales pitch they're giving to the carriers. Right. Now, what I hear there is that what they're saying is we're going to carriers say, hey, Verizon, mm -hmm. we've come up with a system that will allow you to customize it with your own app store, your own music store, and it won't fragment the system. So that, so like to them, probably to the carrier, sounds like, oh, that's a win-win. Oh, right? That sounds but brilliant on the There surface. was a piece I want to so, play so back here. So a core part of our position right. to, to build a deeper relationship with the end user Let me play than that they back. do gate without fragmenting the platform. Right here. They also allow them to, to, to build a deeper relationship with the end user than they do if they're simply a, a pipe uh, for, for voice or data. Okay. <laughs> deeper relationship. I want mm -hmm. my carrier to be a dumb pipe for voice and data. Yeah, I, why would anyone, I mean, now here's, but here's the twist of the carrier wants that deeper relationship. Yes. You as the end user don't give, no. either don't right. care or don't want it. Right, I, I want, no wanting it. I want phone, data, you know, just what I need to be able yeah. to use all of the rich applications yeah. on my smartphone and use the internet. I don't want of my the, phone to be a way for the carrier to sort of cement that relationship. Yeah. Because what I, what I hear as a user is I hear lock-in. Mm -hmm. I hear I hear App Store lock in. I hear I hear service lock in. I don't want to be locked into a carrier. Carrier um, a browser. In carrier fact, this. You might notice that, our sponsor. Yeah. One of the first things I mention every time is contract free. That's right. Right. I'm big on that because I want to own that relationship. Mm -hmm. I, th I I'm not I'm not liking what I'm hearing on that. Okay? No, it sounds like they're really kind of grabbing onto your data. You know. And hanging now, mind it. you, hmm. for guys like you and I, we probably grab our own device. Probably gonna be able to throw an Ubuntu image sure. on there. It's gonna sure. be stock. That's it's right. Not gonna be a problem. Nope. It's it's. It's this use of Linux and Ubuntu to sort of dupe the average user into lock-in that they won't even know is happening, uh, potentially. potentially. I'm not saying that is what's going to happen, but that seems like what Mark is saying. It definitely does, and I think that it's going to be interesting to see where all that transpires. I definitely see the carriers latching onto this, and that's kind of scary. Mm -hmm. Well, they love uh, that. Yeah. Now, there is, he also points out there's a competitive advantage that Ubuntu Phone has over Firefox and Tizen. Okay. So I'm going to play that yeah. for you. Um, and then our independence, you know, strategically is important as well. Uh, there's a very uh, uh, deep dependence in Mozilla on Google, um, which for carriers is uncomfortable. Um, there's a, a very deep dependence in Tizen on Samsung, and that's also uncomfortable. So uh, it's a complicated landscape, but we feel like we have a good story, and, and the response has been very encouraging. Now, before that, he also mentioned that uh, Ubuntu now um, is shipping on like 20% of PCs in China, and that right. uh, on the general PC platform, after Windows, Ubuntu is the widest sold operating system. And so mm -hmm. there is this major community that's building that he's hoping is going to come to the Ubuntu phone platform. So that is right. another competitive advantage of selling to carriers. But I thought his point... Not comfortable. I, I, I would he says, love, so yeah. Firefox, the problem with Firefox OS, and now he... Now, remember, this is supposed to be in the context of carriers. He, what mm -hmm. he's saying is they're concerned that Firefox OS is too tied to Google. Right. Because of that money-making relationship that uh, Mozilla, the, the foundation, has with Google, the company. Right. And they say that Tizen is too tied to Samsung. And the so, mobile key, so if you think about it from... So his argument is that why, why be tied to these guys when they can be tied to you, the carrier, right. instead? Right, because yes. then they'll own it, right? Because they'll more, quote-unquote, own it. They'll have Canonical developing the software, but then they'll take it They'll integrate all of their services around it, and they'll deliver that. And, mm. and, and I have read a lot of rumors that carriers are a little uneasy with Google, carriers are a little uneasy sure. with Samsung because they hold too much power in the relationship, and they prefer... So, like, if you think back to the original day of the phone system, right. when you got a phone, you didn't even own the phone. You rented the phone. That's right. right. I mean, the old rotaries, yeah. Those yeah, were, you those, rented yep, those. Absolutely. And that's how they like the setup to be. Yeah. They want to own it from end to end completely. There is an argument for network stabi stability yeah. and, and predictability. There is an sure. argument for that, but it's more about control and monetization. Well, and it also points out to me that Ubuntu, or, you know, and Marshallworth himself is really less worried about the marketing side of it. If he's willing to turn over that much more control, it sounds like he's basically saying, I'm outsourcing the marketing of this. 
I don't the, care. The carriers are going to market. Yeah, the for carriers them. are going to handle it for them. I'm I'm outsourcing yeah. it to you guys. You yeah. guys do what you need to do. Brand it to your own thing. I'm simply going to be a platform to I'm providing you, and you guys do whatever. It's now, interesting. Um, Friend of the show, uh, Benjamin. He was at Linux Fest. We interviewed oh, yes. him at Linux yep, Fest. Yep. He's a he is an advocate for Firefox OS, and mm -hmm. he was the he was the guy that broke my Firefox OS cherry. Didn't actually yeah, want to say I, that out loud, but yeah, I, did. I, I, I think a cherry has been broken here. <laughs> yeah, I got to play with the Firefox well, the OS phone. He found him actually. He didn't. He found the Google Plus thread where uh, an individual found images of what's being called the Ubuntu Edge phone. Now I'm sure oh, wow. Canon could probably prefer we didn't show these, but. Actually, I cool. think this speaks to the kind of the hype level they're reaching. Now we have like iPhone-like leaks. That's I think this is important. Really, what they want though? Yeah. What do you think of this? This thing looks pretty. Honestly, slick, right? it's pretty gorgeous looking. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I'm a little concerned about some of the other stuff, but I think as a phone device, it looks pretty. It looks pretty good. Uh, so these were pulled off of uh, the Ubuntu.com web servers. So this is from their server. They were obviously staging. It's funny. Every time this stuff leaks, it's always because they're staging for a big PR thing. There was a countdown on Ubuntu's website mm -hmm. for a little while. That went away. Right. These images were pulled off of the web server. The Edge phone, for you audio listeners, is very slick. It looks... Um, it is. It's kind of got an angular look to it. It's it, got it a, I, I hesitate to say this, but it almost, at least from the back, almost resembles a Windows phone. Just a little bit. Well, yeah, they're all kind of just square. I mean, they all kind of... I guess they all kind of do to a degree, but when I looked at it visually, that's what it reminded me. I really like it Because of the, the sharp corners. I really like the button there. Um, it looks like it's got an SD card reader yeah. from this slot right here. It looks like it's got it's a button nice unlocked. It's nice and slim. I like that. The buttons aren't sticking out if, huge or anything. I, I, it's got I a beveled this, kind of thing going on. Yeah, I think that design looks really good. It's not bad. It, it's I have no complaints about the design at all. It's definitely uh, interesting looking. And so... Yeah, it's I'm, fascinating. I'm wondering if it's going to be a lot like Android, where if you really want a pure Android experience, in some cases you just have to ROM, you have to root it and ROM it yourself. I think that's probably, and I think that's what uh, you know, Ubuntu is going to basically push for. It. That's what you want, go for but it. But who want? I don't want to live in that world. I don't either. But that's, you know what I, I like care. is that I, I buy a PC and I load anything I want on it, and it's a general platform. It's a computing platform. Right. I think that's what all of these things should be. But I think the problem is is that because you know Ubuntu is going into this where okay, look, the the advantage we're pitching isn't about the user experience at all. The advantage we're pitching is to the carriers is about the carriers. That we're literally... They gotta love it, that It's pitch. just, yeah, I mean, it's like, wow. You know, I mean, that, You're right, yeah. that, that really should speak to all of us in that it's kind of like, hmm. Well, well, you know, I mean, it's like, I get the, I get the motivation with that, but it's a little kind of like, really? Well, it's, look what look what Google's approach was. Google went to the carrier uh, to the OEMs and said you can customize it any way you want. Put oh, sense that's on true. there. It's, the, it's like true. it was yeah. like that was like the approach they took to get that's them to fair. take it on. And now, uh, yeah. uh, uh, I, don't, I don't. Yeah, so maybe I'm a little early to judge. I'm gonna we'll I'm gonna withhold judgment. I'll withhold. I'm judgment. definitely gonna load my own images and play with totally. it. Totally. Um, all right. I want to talk about before we just move off from Ubuntu. I want to talk about the fact that their forms were hacked this Saturday. Oh, ouch! And if you had an account over there, you need to go reset your password. And yeah, if you totally. have, if you use that password anywhere else. You need to go change it. Mm -hmm. uh, the Ubuntu forms hacked. 1.82 million logins, email addresses have been stolen. Uh, the uh, the hacker, who is obviously an idiot and a loser, uh, defaced the uh, Ubuntu forms website on Saturday. Oh, lovely! And unfortunately, gained gained access to um, the 1.82 million accounts, and they believe that they also have the passwords. Oh, good. He's That's also been getting some. He's been getting some crap on on Twitter. Um, you know, I, you can't hold him completely responsible either. I mean, this is a, a lot of the responsibility. Falls on canonical. For was not it not? This. They weren't patching their stuff. Obviously, I, I yeah. would assume I, was, that's yeah. just pathetic. I mean, come on. This is straight up. You done goofed on the, uh, on the uh, when the guy took wow. over. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and this is one of those. This is one of those circumstances where I want to remind folks. There's things out there like KeyPass and LastPass. Mm -hmm. LastPass is my personal favorite. You can generate a password for every single website that you create an account at, and then if that website is compromised, like the Ubuntu forms just were, then only that site's password. Now, the nightmare scenario is if you use the same password at the Ubuntu forms that you used at your Gmail account or something like mm -hmm. that, you are now in a race against time because these people automate this, they script it, yep. and then they get into your account. Once they have your email account, they then could generate password resets for any site you use and gain access to any That's website right. that you have an account That's at. Right. So and it's what, really important. And an additional layer of protection. This is not a fix for this at all by any means. But another layer of protection is when possible, use two-factor authentication. It's uh, not going to fix everything, but it's, it's a little extra hurdle. Yeah. You know. Uh, there was an official announcement on the UbuntuForms.org website. Mm. They say they're taking it down, so now the forms are down. Wow, that's, uh, that sucks. They say, unfortunately, attackers have gotten every local username and password and email address from the database. The passwords are not stored in plain text, but they are stored in, uh, they are stored in salted hashes. However, if you're using the username and password for your Ubuntu Forms as another service, they strongly encourage you change that password. That sucks. Uh, Ubuntu One and Launchpad also not affected. That's good. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, 
But I mean, if it, this is a patch issue, it's like, I'm sorry, there's no excuse for that. None. But yeah, patching a busy site can be a really difficult thing. They need to watch TechSnap. Well, it, and I know, it's a, I know it's a hassle, but come on. You yeah. Know? I mean, yeah. you know. It's too bad. Jeez. It's really too bad. Um, yeah. All right. Well, that we have sucks. links to all that stuff. If you guys want to read up more about that, including if you want to read the uh, email threads between the kernel developers in full detail, <laughs> we have yeah. links to that in the show notes. But Matt, the news oh, is all yeah. done. So you know what that means. What does that mean? I think we'll go do a little hard drive recovery. I can't lie, it was tragic this past week. I lost a hard drive, and then I lost another hard drive, and then I lost another hard drive. So I lost all of the data. Now, uh, in my case, these were in RAID, so it's a little tricky how it all works. But let's say, let's maybe you're helping a family member, or maybe you've got a desktop rig that had a hard drive fail, or it could be a laptop. Yeah. Um, there's a few ways you can kind of, we're going to show you a few ways where you can determine if your drive is in a fail state if it's approaching failure and you need to act soon, and if it has begun to fail, what you can do if that drive is still spinning to try to get the data off of it so you can at least have some sort of recovery. Right. Um, so we're going to cover all of that, and then also some tools to just kind of keep an eye on things and mm -hmm. to rescue some systems. So I think it's going to be a really great segment. Good stuff. I've been through the fire, Matt, and uh, I'll cover oh, yeah. some of my favorite solutions. But first, I want to thank this week's segment sponsor, and of course, at System76. Over at System76.com, they build machines born to run Linux. Now, they have this Ultra Pro that is so thin, so light, with a beautiful IPS display, Haswell processor, gorgeous new HD um, uh, Intel GPU in there that mm -hmm. is amazing. Mm -hmm. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, that's one end of the spectrum. What do they got at the other end of the spectrum? Friends, I will tell you, they've just updated the Bonobo. The desktop replacement rig. My... Favorite computer I've ever owned, the yes. Bonobo Extreme, now comes with Haswell. The thing's got a sub. The thing's got a subwoofer. <laughs> I, to me, that's just like whoa. yeah. No, no. So look at the, look at look at this look at this machine. This 17-inch 1080p display is gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Now, see the great thing about Haswell is I you know on the Bonobo I the battery life I get about four four hours or which so, is pretty good considering doing. how huge it is. Yeah, I mean this thing's a monster. It's got I mean, dual hard drives. It's got a crazy GPU in there. It's got a quad i7 processor. The power in brick it. as big as my head. It's huge. Yeah. yeah, it's it's a serious workstation machine. It yeah. is to replace a desktop. Yep. So I was always like, yeah, battery life. But the other great thing about Haswell is not only is it faster, mm -hmm. not only does it decode video better, but it oh. also just runs a little cooler too. So oh, it's gonna good. Be great upgrade. The machine's already wonderful, so I can only imagine this makes it better. Now I'm looking at all these great computers over at System76, and I got to tell you, if I was if I was in the market right now to buy a machine mm -hmm. to run Linux, I wouldn't go anywhere else. I don't go oh, anywhere absolutely. else. I want a hassle-free experience. I want that experience that just feels like the whole machine was designed to run Linux. That's the great exactly. thing about System76 is, you know, they've put the thought and care into every single machine that they build. That's right. And what's awesome is I've talked with folks from System76 that, you know, years after a machine's built, they still got a developer working on creating things for mm -hmm. it, drivers for it, that's making right. sure the new upgrades go smooth. They always always, always are taking care of their customers. And that's a big key piece for me personally that I found with machines I've had for, I've got one from 2008 that still runs as good as the day I bought it. That's right. And, uh, you know, I've, I've run OpenSUSE on my Bonobo. I've run Arch, I'm running Arch Linux on it right now. And, of course, they'll come preloaded yep. with Ubuntu. So. Gotta love that, right? Go check them out, system76.com. stuff. Tell them the Linux Action Show sent you. That's right. All right. So right. I want to start with how to kind of tell if your drive's on the way out. That's a good thing to know. Maybe you're a little suspect. Yeah. Maybe you think... A little uh, unsure. Yeah, you're a little unsure of what's going on. Now, there's some command line uh, utilities that we'll link to in the show notes all around the smart tools. I want to sure. show you a GUI program just because that's a good place to start, and mm -hmm. it gives you an idea of what's capable in the command line. Too. Cool. Okay. This GUI is a front end to those command line utilities, and uh, it is called GSmart Control. Oh, yes. And here it is. And you can see in my system, it detects my two Intel SSDs mm -hmm. and my uh, DVD drive, right? That's very cool. So okay. let's go here to my uh, first hard drive, which is like this is my main dev SDA drive, okay? And you can see on the first machine, you get all the information about it. You see it's a 240 gig oh, wow. drive. You can see the firmware version of my SSD. Uh, you get the exact de uh, device model family, mm -hmm. make, all of this stuff. Uh, the last time it's been scanned, if smart's turned on, the overall health assessment right here on the Well, this screen. potentially right at that first window on that first tab could be really great oh, yeah. uh, warranty information. Yep, and you also, like, if you're having trouble and you want to know which firmware do I have, well, right. you can always go tell what firmware is the latest from their website, but how do you know what firmware revisions flash to your hard drive? Yeah, I mean, This is how you tell right here. Uh, what's great, too, is this is now, if you go over to the attributes tab, you really get into the dirt. And if you look, you can go through here and say uh, program fail count. Right now, my raw value is at zero. Nice. But if I was a little concerned, if I, started, if I start seeing some numbers come in this column, then Maybe I know... four or five or something. Oh, yeah. Like then that. I'm starting to get a little... 
Uh, you can see there's uh, you get you get you get a picture of all of the power cycle accounts. It's power cycle 361 times. Wow, that's wow, that's yeah. quite a few. That is really something, isn't it? Uh, you can so you get all of the, you get a snapshot of all of this information in one in one spot, and you can get an idea of you know, if something like if uh, like here's an example right here. If this column had numbers in it, then my drive would be considered in pre-failure stage. That's right. So uh, you see the threshold is 90. So if I have anything that is uh, okay. 90 or above, I know that I, I have a pre-failure drive. So by comparing the threshold with raw value and yep. then looking at the type, okay, it's pre it's a yep. pre-failure column that matters. Right. You really right. need to pay attention see, to. See, some it. of these categories are oh, it's just an old age drive, and right. so I don't need to worry too much because these are just going to start filling out as the SSD ages. And you kind of get an idea of the overall health and vitality mm -hmm. of your SSD drive from just this one screen too. That's really. And cool. now this would also apply to um, a spinning drive. It's not unique to SSD. Well, it also gives not just threshold, but it also gives worst. You know, like yeah. absolutely, like, yeah. you, you, you're screwed, man. You know. Uh, and yeah. Then um, you get some error logs. So if yeah. Smart has detected errors on mm -hmm. your drive, they kick up in here. And then probably the one that you care about the most is you can actually perform some Smart tests right here on demand. You can pick extended tests or short self tests. It takes about a minute when you mm -hmm. run it. It runs through all of uh, the tests. And when you're done, you get a you get a little report that uh, you know will tell you if you had any problems. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. So that's ah. G, that's G Smart Control, and as you can tell, it ah, also like it'll that. it'll work for any drive in your right. system. Um, and so I just check them from time to time. Very tidy. I like how everything's laid out. I love the fact that it gives you the worst case scenario, kind of a threshold, and then of course it really bolds out the things you really need to pay attention. And to. And of course that's open source. That's open source. So that's easy to use. That's G Smart Control now. But like let's it. say uh, you know, you can you can you're you're pulling up D message. Right. And in D message, you're seeing timeout errors on SDA, whatever. Right. You're getting you're getting error messages so on there. Some red flags are being thrown up at you. Maybe like when you mount the drive, your system kind of locks up for a little bit. These are all indications that yeah. drive is it's going out. That's you need right. to get the data off there real quick. That's where an open source program called DD Rescue comes in. Mm -hmm. Now, here's what's great about DD Rescue. You're familiar with DD, I would Absolutely. assume, right? Uh, DD Rescue is DD for data recovery, and I'll link to uh, a, a walkthrough video. You guys can see uh, how this how this process works when you're recovering data on a drive. But think of DD Rescue as like this: it okay. it you start it on a drive, and you can you can assign it some thresholds and some variables. Mm -hmm. And what DD Rescue's essential mission is is it tries to rip through that drive from one end to the other end as fast as possible. And as it goes, every time it hits a bad sector, it marks it along the way, and then it just keeps going, and it writes all this to a raw image file. So you need to store that raw image file on a different drive. I have the syntax for this in the show notes. Um, and then as it finds these errors, once it gets to the end of the drive, it then loops back, and depending on how many times you've told it in the command line mm -hmm. flag, it then once again tries to get those bad sectors. And it'll try, you know, so say you oh, say right. you set it for three times. It'll try, it'll go through, go through all of them again. Almost and giving it the benefit of the doubt on the second pass. The, the right. goal is to get from the beginning of the drive to the end of the drive as fast as possible to get all the data off because DD Rescue has to assume that right. that drive could fail at any minute. So its mission is everything I can read, I read it. Then I go back, I try to read those bad sectors. And I keep narrowing that list of sectors I can't read to down till it's down, down, down until oh, it's cool. zero. I've either because I can't read them and I've tried my my defined amount mm -hmm. of times, or it's zero because I've recovered them. And it it will store all of that in an image file that then you can then just mount as a loopback file system and just browse that drive. Oh, that's fantastic! I mean, yeah. what, and I love the fact that it's really uh, bent on the urgency of getting the data off as quickly as possible. That's yeah. really important. Right now. That's a great utility, but it wasn't enough for like the Department of Defense and um, like you know law cases where maybe you've got somebody's drive and you right. need it for forensic purposes. Mm -hmm. So there's another utility I just kind of want to put on your radar. It's called DC3DD. It's essentially what we just talked about. However, it's got some nifty extra features added in. Uh, it has supports multiple types of hashing, which is great depending oh, on wow. your requirements. Uh, combined error logs. It also this is a big one depending on if you've got a bad drive and you just want to mm -hmm. keep working on it for a while. Supports progress reports while it's running. Oh, that's cool. So if you've got like a manager that wants right. to know what the state of that drive recovery is, yeah. the one nice thing about DC3DD is you can generate status reports mid-work cycle, whereas DD Rescue is once it goes, you get a little output on the command line, but you don't get a lot more mm -hmm. than that. And I guess I would all say one is like, uh, th the first one I think is really good for like urgency. It's yes. like, I gotta yeah. just get the data off. If you're, if you're not really as worried about it, you just right. kind of want to see progression. And if you want to be able, if you want an yeah. audit trail, and if you want right. to say, this is exactly the drive. So I'll give you a, a case for this. Is I had a uh, law firm client mm -hmm. who had a drive go bad on him. And um, they were holding our consulting company responsible for that because we deployed the machine, because yeah. we're responsible for data backup and all that kind of stuff. So during that process, I had to provide them with a you know an, uh, an obvious action path that I took 
and how I could validate it every step that I took every means possible to recover oh, that data. Right. And this yeah. is a lawyer I'm pretending so, I, to. Yeah, I've been there. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's 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 why I, that's one reason why I like DC3DD. Now these are all open source. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. You kind of need to use these tools when, if it's your main hard drive, you don't want it to be the actor drive you're booted off of. Right. Exactly. And I can I can name all these programs for you, but what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to point you at a couple of different solutions mm -hmm. that include these tools with them that are designed to recover a, a failed oh. system. I think the one that everybody like that. probably in the chat room is thinking of right now, the yeah. one that comes to everybody's uh, front of mind when you think of a, 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 mm -hmm. of a burnable, bootable CD, System Rescue CD. That's right. The classic. It's right? the go-to thing. Right? It comes with part image, mm -hmm. comes with DD Rescue. You can put it on a USB stick. It's got all kinds of amazing tools. Loves it. Everybody should have System Rescue yep. written to a USB thumbstick at some point. Oh, I've used it. <laughs> when you need it, you really need it, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, so I want to give a mention of that because that will include all the tools we're talking about. It's sort of the go-to classic. But I want to point you in a couple of maybe other not as well-known tools. Okay. First of all, I'm a big CloneZilla fan. Oh, yeah. You know, I think, good stuff. I think the best way to avoid a data failure is to have your stuff backed up mm -hmm. before it happens. Um, so one of the ways you can do this is by generating a CloneZilla live disk. Okay. There's a really nice utility called Tuxboot. Open mm -hmm. source in your repo. You install Tuxboot, and it is a fork of Unet Bootin. Oh, really? And all oh, it does is pulls down the absolute latest yeah. either CloneZilla's or uh, Tux to Live, mm -hmm. or Cloud Boots, uh, or uh, DRDBL uh, testing, or G-Parted Live CDs, the absolute wow. latest of these recovery-type backup environments, and you just select what you want. So say maybe I want uh, CloneZilla Live, right? and I could just write it immediately to a USB thumb drive. It would download it from the CloneZilla SourceForge mirror, and then write it to a USB thumbstick, and you can go boot it. It's, so it's UNet booting, it's UNet booting with a focus on uh, backup and recovery live images. That could be really handy. Yeah, so that's Tuxboot. Oh, yeah. You install Tuxboot, hmm. and then it will go out and grab those images for you. You write them to a disk, or you write them to an ISO file, or you write them to a thumb drive, and you're good to go. No hunting down ISOs. You yeah. don't even have to pop open a web browser. Yeah, and if, you got, if you're in that high blood pressure situation, uh -huh. you know, you're like, oh, yeah, you, you're, you're not really wanting to browse the web. <gasps> Oh, yeah, you just want to, and, you know, the nice thing is the tool downloads it and writes mm -hmm. it to the thumbstick, so, like, you can go get yourself a sandwich while it's working. All right, cut a cup of coffee, cool off a little bit. Yep. Yeah. Um, all right, so now I want to talk about OSF Clone. This is the one I found a while ago that is really, really great. Oh. So it includes a lot of the tools we're talking about. It's a uh -huh. boot CD. It's built around... Uh, uh, it's it's all about cloning a drive. So you okay. get in there, you can clone it. Drive in a there's tools to clone a drive in a failed state. There's oh. tools to clone a drive in a good state. And the idea is that it is it gives you a complete audit trail of what you've done from end to end. So it's almost like Clonezilla on steroids. Yeah, yeah, and, and they support some industry wide uh, format standards mm -hmm. that uh, like if you're going to be handing off to contractors, right. you need to give them an image. Or if you're going to a data recovery specialist and you want to be sure that they can read the image to do data right. recovery for you, you can give them images produced by this, and they comply with the industry standards so that other people can use software to recover and, and read, and it also will hold up in court. So it's like a whole range Very of stuff cool. that OSF Clone So not is only are you making of. your life easier, you're making their job easier, and probably going to end up with getting more data recovery in the process. That's exactly it. Yeah, That's good the stuff. Goal. Uh, and, and so here's my solution. Mm. I, I use a combination of the uh, smart drive tools, which are kind of a little hit and miss. Yeah. They sometimes will catch stuff, sometimes won't. They're better now on more modern drives. But sure. um, my approach in my, in my house now is I've always been worried about like some Arch update just blowing up my system. It can happen. So I started with uh, the way I've designed my, my machine here, and I'll bring up my terminal so you guys in the video version can see this, is if we look at um, my, um, well, that's a huge, oh, huge yeah. mount table. But if we look at my mount, the key things you can pull out is I have slash home on SDB1, mm -hmm. right? And I have slash on SDA1 or something like that. Somewhere or dev there. SDA3. Yeah, there dev yeah. SDA3. The reason I have put slash, which includes slash user and var mm -hmm. and Etsy right. and all that stuff, the reason why I have my home drive broken out on a separate hard drive is I can now boot and I can image dev SDA3 entirely. And I'm not imaging my Steam games. I'm not imaging my VirtualBox VMs. I'm just imaging all of my configs, all my binaries, all of that stuff, and I save that on an NFS share in my home network. So CloneZilla boots up off of this live USB thumb drive. It asks for my NFS server, and I can't show it to you because the HDMI signal won't work if I boot off of that. But you ask for that. You give it the NFS server, and then it saves it to a spot, which I actually have access to. So when my machine boots up, I then mount that NFS share here. Oh, cool. So I have in my box, I have, yeah. this part, I have this part image folder where all of my machine images are stored. Mm -hmm. So later on, if I need to go get something, I can Just go mount boom. that, and I can go pull it out, or I can boot off of the CloneZilla Live CD again, 
mount that end of the share and restore my laptop. So back. that's really great. And what's awesome is by having those not just a dedicated directory, but you actually have a you know dedicated partition, but you right. dedicated drive. Yeah, that way that, I, I mean can, that's that really way. Smart. And the reason is is because if I'm in a real if I'm in a real tight yeah. situation, I just want to know that I I can just restore. I can just DD this drive. I right. can I can clone Zill. I can just do anything to this entire drive and all of my. Steam games, all of my home files are all on a separate drive. They're totally protected. I'm not blasting any bits to right. that. And I can back that up separately if I want to as well. And it makes recovery like that. Yeah. It's nice and easy. And what's, you know, when you look at things like Tuxboot and you mm -hmm. look at System Rescue CD and DD Rescue, these are all tools that are open source and free. Uh, guys, I will t I, I'll tell you, they're as good, if not better, than the multi-thousand dollar commercial yes. solutions that I've used. Like, like DD Rescue, it's the bee's knees and it's free software. It's... Yeah. There's a video I've linked in the show notes. Um, Google brought in a forensic, di a digital forensics engineer. His job is data recovery and verifying that data. It's about a 45-minute talk. Mm -hmm. They talk about some of these tools. I have that linked in the show notes. And one of the things that he mentions in that talk is, you know, his company tried the different tools. They bought, oh, did, did they they bought really? the $10,000, you know, uh, forensics tools. And at the end of the day, they ended up using the open source uh, tools because wow. they were just easier, quicker, superior, and... Um, easier to manage on those little thumb drives. Well, and by him, him sharing that with everybody in that video, it enables you not to uh, make that same costly <laughs> yeah. mistake. Yeah, you and know? now we've imparted that wisdom via our show to yep. you. We so, just saved you $10,000. Yeah, hopefully if you get in a stuck position, you'll find this episode of Linux Action Show and mm -hmm. you can use some of these tools, maybe get some of those pictures back or whatever it is. Sure. And, it, and guys, go check out CloneZilla. Back up your stuff. Whatever Absolutely. you want to use, just go make sure you're doing some backup. Absolutely. Back it up first. Don't, don't yeah. find yourself in a state of recovery if you can avoid it. Trust me, yeah. I just lost 12 terabytes worth of data. Ouch. Back it up. Back oh. it up, you guys. It's, it's brutal. Ouch, ouch. All right, Matt. That's the Linux Action Show's look at rescuing that dying drive. It's time for Slash Etsy, and this segment is brought to you by Untangle. Untangle fans, go over to untangle.com slash last. Now, you know these firewalls, these things are like a great demonstration of the power of Linux on top of a beautiful and easy to use and easy to understand UI. Untangle firewalls work flawlessly once you have them installed. And you can get their U-Series appliance if you want it nice and easy. They have great content filtering as well. You can get these different packages. You get the web filter, you get live support, policy manager, WAN failover and WAN balancers, IPsec VPNs, web cache, bandwidth control, virus blockers, spam blockers. These are great for small businesses. You guys think about this. Think about putting one of these boxes at the edge of your network that can protect those Windows machines you might have in that business network. I love Untangle Firewalls because you can go from your own machine when you download this free ISO over at untangle.com slash last. And once you, you could toss that on your own box. Maybe you've got a nice machine you want to throw that on. Or maybe you want to deploy it on one of their nice appliances. It's great because you can get started with that ISO. And then upgrade to an appliance when you're ready. Good stuff. Good stuff. So go over to untangle.com slash last. And if you want to get one of their packages to manage some of the stuff and make it really smooth, use the code LAST20 when you check out. You'll save 20% on your subscription. Good stuff. Good deal. Thanks, Untangle. Big thank you. All right. So this right. week in Slash Etsy, I want to talk about setting up a honeypot. Okay. I'm sort of um, in phase one of this. I'm working mm -hmm. on a, a, a Kale Linux or Kali Linux oh, segment right. for the show. Good, good choice. But I also thought, you know, maybe it's just a good idea for all of us just to have a honeypot. And I know that I sounds so. crazy, but when you take a, you got a device like this here, Raspberry Pi, nice, portable, low power. You can put this on your machine and not feel guilty about this thing sipping the right. small amount of watts it's going to take. And I thought, you take something like this, you have it running one of these distros that is specifically vulnerable, and think of it as sort of a magnet for the attacks. And the key for a good honeypot is something that looks convincing, that doesn't look like a honeypot. And, it's uh, attractive, but not too right. attractive. And the idea would be to sort of have a, have a device that gives off the right types of signals. Maybe it gives off like a Windows XP OS fingerprint. Mm -hmm. Or uh, maybe it looks like it's running some monitoring software because monitoring right. servers are a common attack vector. Maybe uh, it looks like a mail server. And open mail up all the right common. ports. <laughs> you know? Right. Probably. Not just open the right ports, but respond in such a way that the packets are mm -hmm. timed right, that the OS, uh, that the... That the uh, that the hello flags come back just right. Mm -hmm. Everything needs to look just right. And then the idea would be that the attacker would go after that machine instead of an actual, That's right. you know, important machine. But to actually use this, to actually take advantage of this, you need software that once it's being attacked, once that bait has been nibbled on, you need to know. You, know, well, you need to be alerted right. so you know it's working or not working. Otherwise, you could just throw like a spin of Fedora 14 right. up on an internet connection <laughs> like, and yeah. call it good, right? right. No, you need to know when someone's yeah. going after it. You need to be able to get metrics from that data and analyze that so you can protect yourself better. Right. So I started off, 
I found this great post over at InfoSec Institute, and I'll link to it in the show notes, it, about uh, glass, glass off, and I think that's how you pronounce glass it. Glass off, yeah, I think so. Yeah, and, and it lets you turn your uh, Raspberry Pi into a honeypot. Mm. And what's really cool about this is it also gives you some of the metrics to monitor when it's happening. Now, I'll nice. tell you. I only got so far because I, I, I made the mistake of uh, I loaded this on an 8 gig SD card oh. and I already had a few other things on here and then when you add Debian yep, or Raspbian yep. mm. I filled up my SD card and that I ran into that issue pretty quick so you need to you need to use a fairly decent sized SD mm. card because it's got uh, quite a bit of a, a, a dependencies that you have sure. to install you a little room to move a lot of Python stuff that has to get installed mm -hmm. kind of all broken out here but if you've got an SD card with sufficient storage this is definitely really cool. I looked at this project. This is really awesome. I'm going to kind of circle back on this maybe right. next week or the week after. But that was the first thing I tried. When that failed me, because of my own shortcomings, sure. uh, I went a different route. I decided to go the VM route. And this is a oh. route that I've taken before, but I found a new, a new virtual appliance over at the Brute Force Labs blog called Honey Drive. Mm -hmm. This is so awesome. <laughs> this Honey Drive is it's a virtual appliance based on Zubuntu 1204, oh. uh, and it comes distributed as an OVA file. You know what an OVA file is, Matt? Have you heard I, of I've not heard of that. These are template files for VirtualBox. So it's, okay. So it you 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 launch it here, and what it does is it brings up VirtualBox, and it says, "Oh wow, here's yeah. all the appliance settings. Here's the drive name. Here's, oh, so it's like all ready to go. Yeah, here's your memory <laughs> allocation. They've, so it's a totally pre-configured, including your hardware settings and everything already. Oh yeah, oh, where yeah. you want it stored. I hit import. My VirtualBox is set up. Oh, right? that's. Yeah, so that's mm. it's real easy to get rolling with this guy, mm. and uh, I've got it. I got it up, and I got it running. I'll show it to you. It's right somewhere in here on one of these windows. I have too many windows open. There it is. Um, all right, so this is Honey Drive, and I like one, the wallpaper. Yeah, one of the cool things about Honey Drive is once you log in, you go go follow go fire up this README here, and okay. you'll see that they've got a bunch of really really perfect software for a honeypot pre-installed. Oh, this uh, Kippo yeah. right here. Is awesome. This is an S this is an SSH server mm -hmm. that is designed to look like a vulnerable SSH server. This is one of the most common attack right. vectors. And so what it does is it puts out the bait out there. It's okay. I'm SSH. I'm vulnerable. <laughs> Come get me. <laughs> That's cool. And then it's got this whole backend graphing mm -hmm. system and logging system. It logs to MySQL of all of the attacks. Oh, so you yeah. throw this on the internet, you'd be a, you'll be inter it is really interesting what you'll catch. And, and it could almost be a real learning experience, if nothing else. Oh, totally. Right. It gives you an idea of how to. This is the whole thing. Is it gives you an idea of how to protect your network. Uh, by using these kinds of things. They've got um, mm. Honey D, which is another really, really well-known Honeypot mm -hmm. uh, software. It hasn't been under active development for a little while, but it's on here. Still works. Yeah. Tons of great scripts. They've got software on here that will emulate Windows XP, so the system will look like a Windows XP box oh, running whoa. maybe Messenger. They've got, you, oh, can, wow. you can emulate old versions of MySQL. Uh, and, mm. then it, and then the great thing around this, and this is probably what in the next week or two I'll kind of demonstrate on the show, is yeah. it'll collect and display a lot of these metrics for you. Oh, so you so just cool. all you have to do is download this VM, throw it on a box that you can allocate a little bit of resources mm -hmm. to and expose it to the internet and just let it sit watch the days. chaos. Yeah. Just make sure you have it isolated from the rest of your network. Right. I think that's a key factor. Yeah. Uh, so that's HoneyDrive 0.2 from BruteForce.gr. And you mm -hmm. use the, so you can use, you know, we'll have links in there for the Raspberry Pi, but if you've got VirtualBox installed, check this out. It's really well done. They've also included uh, some handy tools. Um, some good like OS fingerprinting, Etherape, which is great for uh, HTOP, which uh, was almost a pick. Mm -hmm. uh, shoot, probably shouldn't have said that because I was going to make it a pick. It's okay. That's all right. Everybody forget that for a second. Uh, they've got some DNS query tools in here. They've also got ZenMap, which is a front end to uh, NMap. Oh. And it uh, gives you OS fingerprinting. It gives you checking for uh, all kinds of different remote system information. Get the, all the open ports on a box. So like, let's say if we go scan 10.1.10.254. You yeah, see how it true. fills out the nmap uh, command there for me? Oh, that's nice. That's very handy. Yeah, you could so you could literally just copy and paste that into the terminal. You've wow. got that. So now I'm going to go scan my free NAS box here. Mm -hmm. It'll try to do things like OS fingerprinting and all this kind of stuff. FreeBSD is really good at um, sort of smacking this stuff down yeah. from the get-go. So it usually doesn't find much. But it, it is very fascinating to run this against uh, your network. And you get all of the information back from these different boxes about all mm -hmm. of the ports they have open. You know, oh, it got it. It actually oh, got it. It got FreeNAS. Look at that. It, oh, because oh. of Samba. It pulled it from Samba. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. So this is an interesting thing. You see how, so you see what it did here is it found that the Samba port was open, right? Uh huh. And then look at this. Once it finds that, once that, it got that it was FreeBSD. Oh, it got that I'm running wow. FreeNAS. It got that it's Samba 3.613. Oh, so it's got your versions now. It's it on. even got the system time. And that actually. This is, getting the system time can actually be a valuable piece of information when you're trying to do certain types of attacks. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, it got more than I expected. Wow. So this, yeah, just a little bit of learning experience right here. It's like, hey, 
Yeah, and it, you see, as you scan different things on your network, it'll start to map out your oh, network Oh, it gives you a topology. visual yeah. graphic? I've only scanned one device, but you could sure. scan your whole network if you wanted to. Wow. Yeah. So there's lots of cool toys that come with uh, this as well. I could see someone spending a weekend with this. Oh, it's fun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's good times. And, you've, and it's all about finding your soft spot. Right. And this is, you know, people get paid to do this, so... Go Good to, thing to learn. These are the tools. Like if you if you were to hire Chris the consultant to come in and audit your network, mm-hmm. these are some of the tools I would use. Wow. And if you wanted to do a risk assessment to see if maybe you are under attack, this could be a tool you use. Interesting. Yeah, we'll have links to all of this in the show notes, and uh, I suspect you'll probably hear more about all of this in a future slash Etsy segment, or maybe a, uh, another segment. So Good we're looking stuff. at all of this stuff, but go check out Honey Drive. You can get it over BruteForce.gr. You just throw that in a virtual box, and within a couple of minutes. You got something you can bang against. It's a lot of fun. And check the README. It's got the logins and mm-hmm. passwords. It's got links to all of the programs you can try, where all of their config files live, and how to start the services. It's very easy to Does get. Does it going. tell you how to? Uh, yeah, I'm sure it probably reminds everybody to keep everything isolated. I would imagine so. Mm-hmm. You, yeah. you guys know now. You need to know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If you've got a DMZ, you can throw it in, or don't yeah. expose it to the internet. And if Maybe you don't know how, online. Google how. Yeah. 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 Or stay tuned for a future episode. Ooh, that. yeah, that's not a bad idea. Yeah, yeah. That's good stuff. All right, Matt, that's the Linux Action Show's look at protecting your network with a honeypot. All right, that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast, Matt. Yes. But before we get out of here, I thought we'd cover some feedback. All right, let's hear it. And we got a bunch of really great emails this week. Oh, we always get some good stuff. And some bit messages. Oh, some bit messages tossed into those emails. Yeah, in fact, fact, bit message has really been taken off. People have been enjoying the open source messaging goodness. That's cool. Uh, Before we jump into the emails, I want to mention, if you'd like to help contribute to the uh, Jupyter Broadcasting Hard Drive Fund, I just created a uh, uh, Hard Drives for Jupyter wish list. If you have a few free 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 dollars and want to kick Mm -hmm. us a hard drive, I've got that linked in the show notes. And uh, uh, we will. Uh, cause the idea was so the three drives. I have replaced these three drives that failed. Right here. That's fine. The issue was is that I was already out of space. And I needed to buy more drives. So the drives I was going to buy, you know, to hold more mm-hmm. shows, I ended up spending on just replacing dead so drives. The replaced drives allowed him to tread water. Now we need yeah. to quit treading yeah. and actually start yeah. swimming again. It's like yeah. so now it's at the point now where before I can edit a show, I have to delete all of the master files of the pa- of the previous yeah. show. So now I've now given up on holding all master files. And I just Ouch. hate that. I oh, hate that. That hurts. So yeah. uh, we are definitely tight. So if you'd like to help contribute to the hard drive fund, uh, I'll have the wish list in the show notes. And if you just buy it there, it sends it to my house. Nice. Easy peasy. Nice, nice, nice. All right, Matt, our first email comes in from Ryan. Yeah. And he says, hi, Chris and Matt. I'm a big fan and I've been watching all the Jupiter Broadcasting shows almost religiously for the past few years. Cool. And I, I also weigh in on a few G Plus discussions sometimes. Last week, someone emailed in asking about trying out Android x86. Uh-huh. I, found, I, I have found that the best use case for Android x86 was for troubleshooting. Really? When I worked at my last job, we provided many data services, and I found the best way to support users using various versions of Android was to set up multiple virtual machines with different versions of Android, gingerbread, through honeycomb, to ice cream sandwich, which were most popular at the time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I showed this to my managers, and they had me install the virtual machines on their machines and the help desk guys' computers. We found it useful for troubleshooting and following that the users were describing. This is very interesting. Anyways, one reason run x86, and that's my rant. Keep up the good work. That's kind of a cool idea. I really, you know, he says, by the way, of course, with different manufacturers and custom UIs, it's sometimes difficult, but it's better than nothing, and it beats the heck out of what iOS can virtually do. Oh, no kidding. You know, being able to run the different versions of Android in emulation just to test stuff out makes total sense. Totally. Well, and for troubleshooting, it's like someone's describing to you they're having the problem, and you're all, "Uh, I'm not in front of you. I don't know what you're seeing. I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, yeah, that Mm -hmm. would really help out. Good stuff. Craig email, uh, bit messaged in. He says, uh, hey, Chris, Matt, and Alan. Hey. I'm testing out BitMessage and hope you guys get this. I know you're busy, but I wanted to say a few things. Mm-hmm. I use BitTorrent Sync for fun. I have shares going between myself and my brother-in-law and uh, the computers in my house. We have an applications folder, and it's syncing about 11 gigs, wow. 276 files, mostly Windows stuff, and some ISOs. 85.6 gigs of ISOs to be total in total. <laughs> Um, he says, and my main profile of my Windows computers is mostly documents and crap, but we have about 92 gigs worth of stuff, 47,000 files getting saved. Whoa, that is crazy. Yeah. Wow. He said, I'd love to share a folder with you guys that has all the last and tech snap videos. We're working on something kind of like that, Craig. Yeah. Stay tuned. Not totally, but tune in, though. Yeah. He says, I tried out Zorn OS, and I love it. Mm-hmm. I have one customer that I've taken off Windows from and switched her from her old machine to Zorn OS. We were kind of talking about how Zorn OS could cool. be there. He says, I'm even contemplating using it myself. So I just sent you guys 100 bucks to keep up the show. Oh, thanks. Greg. Wow, Thank right on. So I enjoy listening. And he's also the guy that hosts the Jupiter Station bot in our IRC chat room. Very cool. Yeah. Email comes in from Pierre in Sweden. 
via bit message. He's switching back to Pop 3. Matt, I was watching the live stream when you checked your bit, mes bit messages last Sunday. I have to say, it was kind of funny seeing your reactions in real time while reading my message. Was about to test LTSP on my netbook this week, but things have been running away from me. The mm -hmm. next three days, remember he asked about running Linux terminal service right, project? Right, right. Yeah. So by the way, the reason I'm interested in running Linux terminal service is allocating the workstation for threefold. First of all, I reverted back to POP3 for my local ISP, and having both my desktop and TV do the work on the same workstation enables me to use PGP on both places using only one inbox and sent box and one home folder in both places, kind of like an in-house cloud mail. So he wants to yeah. essentially use one computer and then LTSP everywhere else so that way everything's using the same stuff. I can see logic in that, totally. Second, yeah. getting rid of the workstation noise when using Netflix and other media. And thirdly, just to learn how the S works. You guys are great. I love what you're doing. Awesome. Best. Right on. Well, deal. if you get it working, uh, I think you want to try XBMC through Linux Terminal Service yes. Project. Let us know how that turns out. I don't know if it's doable. It would be cool to find out, though. I think it would be dependent on you need to have a Linux Terminal Server client front end that can load a binary driver. So you, right. it's not impossible. I've done it a long time ago, but you need to find a way where I think what, I think the way, if I remember, it works is when you when you have a Linux Terminal Server client, it boots up, it TFTPs a, ker a kernel okay. from your Linux Terminal Server, and then loads. You need like the regular kernel modules that be loaded. And I think if right. you have like a proprietary video driver or whatever you need, some sort of accelerated driver, right, right. you're gonna need. You're okay. gonna probably need. You're gonna need yeah. a good driver to play back. You know, 1080p. Absolutely. I don't know. Maybe we'll see. Yeah, that would be interesting to see how that works out, though. I'm definitely curious. VK's yeah. got a question. He says, "Chris and Matt, last is great. Follow it regularly." I'd like to know your opinion on CentOS versus Oracle Linux for enterprise servers. He says, "Red Hat Enterprise Linux is not an option, as I can't buy a subscription." Which one is better in your experience and why? I've read reviews making claims of OELs not as good because professional Linux guys don't build it. On the other hand, there is not a very quick update window with CentOS with new releases of Red Hat Enterprise Linux are out. Thanks for your review. So VK is asking, both Oracle Linux mm. and CentOS Linux are based on Red Hat Enterprise Linux. True. Yeah. I've had no experience, experience with Oracle. Oracle myself, Linux. So. so here's the advantages of Oracle Linux. Um, the name. So that's good for like some CEOs and CTOs out there. Sure. right? Makes them feel better. Decent support package, so you can deploy it, and then later on, if you want to buy Oracle support, you can. Okay. That's nice. No, that's um, and it generally has a closer release to Red Hat Enterprise Linux, where CentOS in the past has sometimes had very large windows of time where they didn't. Now, they're working on that, and that's getting better. Okay. But VK, what it comes down to is Oracle Linux is kind of the bastard of the community. And if you're going to bring in a contractor or a consultant at any point, or you're going to maybe go look for some applications, they're, they're always going to be familiar or going to certify CentOS in most cases. Mm -hmm. Oracle Linux, you're kind of then dependent on that vendor or that contractor to know what it is, to be familiar with it, and that's just not as common. So that's why, probably a lot of reasons why people kind of point you in the direction of CentOS. At the end of the day, they're kind of the same thing. Sounds like they would be. I mean, like I said, I know, I know not very little about Oracle, but I mean, so basically, in comparison to like Red Hat, what explain that to me? What would that be? Uh, they're very similar. They're almost I mean, like, they're so almost the same code. The subscription price difference? They're, well, the Oracle you buy when you need it. Okay. Right. Okay. So and then just, Red Hat's just ongoing. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's one big difference. Yeah. yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Riley in the chat room says maybe you should check out Sue's Enterprise. Definitely that's good. I'm assuming that. he needs Red Hat Enterprise Linux compatibility. There's a lot of enterprise apps out there that yeah. you got to have that. That's kind of the thing. Yeah. But I, I lean myself towards CentOS in this scenario, but mm. you're not really going to go too wrong going with Oracle. I just I feel a little dirty saying that. <laughs> um, I have no idea how you say this guy's name. I'm just going to call him Chomp. Chomp okay. writes in and says, Hey, guys, it'd be really cool if you looked at an open source operating system called React OS. React OS. Maybe not in the main segment, but in the slash Etsy segment. It's an operating system that aims to have full driver and software compatibility with Windows NT 5.2, oh. a.k.a. Windows Server 2003. I think we could give okay. it Okay, yeah, why not? Uh, the only reason I the only reason I kind of was it's kind of a Windows clone, so we've never really talked about it on the show. But we've we've gotten a lot of people asking for us to take a look at it. So I think we will slot it into a future slash Etsy. And I'm gonna look at it from the idea of could I run it under VirtualBox or something like that to get Windows compatibility oh, right. when awesome. I'm running Linux mm -hmm. legitimately without having like you know that gray area? Am I pirating a copy of exactly. Windows? Do I actually own it? Am I violating TOS by having right. a VM? I mean, anything. there's no way I want to go out and buy a cold copy of Windows 8 uh, no. to install in VirtualBox for compatibility. But if React yeah. OS could get me close to it without having to pay that Windows license and be in a legal zone... That would be kind of cool. Yeah. That would be very cool. Even if it didn't run all the apps I wanted, it just ran maybe a couple of them. That'd be kind of neat. Uh, Charum seems a little mixed. They, you know, I think this is a good opportunity to try it out because they're saying like, eh, says it's basically just wine, one person says. Uh, okay. Uh, Riley says React OS is the most uh, godforsaken OS ever created. <laughs> 
I so think you love it, clearly, right? I think it's going to be a good one to try out. I, I think, think, I think, yeah. I think, uh, I think because that way really, we can either hate it or love it. You know, I think it's going to be really interesting to see. Uh, it, it looks like things this really polarized. So in maybe there. we really need to do a reactor. What I find so interesting about that is the chat room so strongly anti react OS, but yet we get so many emails saying we should try it. Well, I guess it's you. There's no indifference. You either love it or hate it. I guess. I guess so. Yeah. Well, I don't. I I am currently indifferent. Maybe after next yeah. week, uh, I will. And feel I'm pretty indifferent myself. I yeah. Not, yeah. I'll see what happens. Stay so, tuned yeah. and find out. Matt, what yes. can people? What, where can people find you? Where are you up to this week? You know, maybe they didn't get enough Matt during the Linux Action Show. <laughs> yeah, no, you can always find me at datamation.com. Scroll down to Open Source and oh uh, clicky clicky, and I'm usually doing one versus or another article. So yeah, yeah, I like this. I like this one. I like this so, one, Matt. Kinda, I try. I, I try not to get too fanboy. Well, you didn't about pick anything. the headline. Uh -uh, Ubuntu uh -uh. versus Debian. Yep, yep, yep. Debian offers speedy, stable Linux experience if you're willing to put in a little work. Now, do you come up with the sub-headline? No, actually, I, I have some feedback on the actual title to yeah, a degree, but yeah. the sub-headline is all, all editor. All editor, yeah. so he's yeah, really good at that sort of stuff. Yeah. But, you know, it's kind of interesting to because I have no real... I'm I'm running like Arch and Manjuro kind of situation. I'm right. not. I have no looking at it from a, of Ubuntu or Debian. Yeah, care. total third party perspective. Yeah. You know, it's interesting too because yeah. I've always thought maybe if I ever left Arch, I might go to Debian. So I might take a and, look at it. And that. Debian is pretty zippy. You know? Yeah, got yeah. some zippiness. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, uh, I want to give a plug to a couple of things we've got yeah. coming up now. Uh, just a reminder before I mention those things is this: make sure you're checking Jupiter Broadcasting. dot com slash calendar. Yes. My uh, wife is upstairs right now, and she's like. Crazy prego. Like, there's there's people who are pregnant, and then there's people who have been pregnant now for too long. And crazy pregnant. And then she gets crazy pregnant, and she's really, she's going to pop any mo any right. minute, so we could have some show disruptions. Sure. All of that, hopefully, will be outlined over com slash calendar. Otherwise, you can always join us live on Mondays for Coda Radio. If you're in the car at 9 a.m., noon Eastern, That's go right. to jblive.info, and you can stream it while you're driving. If you're sitting at your desk, you can nice. use the audio feed. You we also love the video that. feed, too. We're everywhere. Man. Yeah, man. And if you want a commuter's friend... The last two weeks of TechSnap have been supersized. It's almost, almost hitting the two hour Without the mark. calories, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. no, no, it's, it's, it's good for you. It's veggies. It's veggies. veggies for the mind. Nice. They don't taste too bad. Though. Good stuff. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning in this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. We'll see you right back here next week. Whoa! Whoa! Recommend these. I'm gonna recommend these. Hardy recommendation, well, the man. The problem is, is you didn't back it up over AOL dial-up. Right. I mean, clearly that would have solved all your there problems. There is a problem where it's, really, where it's like you can't. How do you back up? You can't. How do you back up 12 terabytes? No, like, what no. do you back that up to? When a man loves a race car driver, she gets you a discount domain. Ooh. We're going to talk about this later, but you see, this is my home server, Tuna, okay? With smells.txt. Um, like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hate it. You're, you're full of not mine. No, look, look it's, uh, it's playing. It's just, I just needed to touch a file, right. so Absolutely. I just like, ah, smells.txt. Um, <laughs> I, I was called out last week because I had a chat handle called Chris Fucker. All my internal stuff. <laughs> All my internal stuff is really dirty. Like, uh, so here. Yeah, yeah, like, like look, it, if we like look at my mount I've places, got, if we look at my mounts here, uh, yeah. mount. There we go. You can see that uh, I have uh, m slash mnt slash fart. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, yeah, but it's easy to remember, right? Yeah, exactly. That's why. This stuff was on our mind anyway. So.